From Captain America and Spider-Man to the X-Men and the Hulk. Anyone else? Even if you've never read the comics, you'll likely recognize these iconic superheroes and their world-famous creator. I think it would be quite accurate to say that Marvel revolutionized the superhero comic. With thousands of characters and interweaving storylines, the Marvel Universe is one of the most astonishing tales in modern fiction. But it all began to unravel for the company at the turn of the millennium. It was losing sight of what you were trying to sell. Sell stories. It was kind of like a victim of its own success. Every great story has a point where the hero is on his knees, seemingly beyond salvation. Marvel's darkest hour came when it declared bankruptcy, followed by an all-out war between investors that raged for years. There was a lot of screaming on telephones and threats to destroy one another. Everybody was just scared to death. This is the inside story of how one of the world's most beloved pop culture icons re-emerged from the ruins of its comic book empire and fought its way back to the top. New York, home to Marvel's headquarters and to many of its superheroes. From dramatic battles at Grand Central Station to spectacular rescues on the Staten Island Ferry. Part of the magic of Marvel for longtime fans like Sean Howe is that its characters are set in the real world. People that I knew from New York City, they had the feeling that they might uh, you know, catch a glimpse of a superhero battle, you know, when they're on their way to the post office or something. For almost 80 years, Marvel has captivated comic fans across the globe, producing best-selling comic books, cartoons, video games, okay, Lee, here I come. and record-breaking box office hits. Marvel has conquered the entertainment world. But rewind three decades earlier, and Marvel wasn't just battling comic supervillains. It was combating bankruptcy, staff defections, and tied up in a legal battle that threatened to destroy the company. Now I know what you're thinking. How did this happen? Well, it's a long story. To find out, we go back to the beginnings of the Marvel Universe. The superheroes we know today were born in New York in the late 1930s. In the midst of the Great Depression, Marvel's rival, DC Comics, created a character that became an instant hit. Superman was an inspiration for a lot of kids in the Depression. He was a crusader for the masses. Superman was soon followed by another caped crusader. The two propelled DC Comics' popularity well ahead of Marvel, then just a small pulp fiction publisher known as Timely. From earlier years, Marvel was always the kind of second place company. Superman and Batman at DC Comics were, were kind of the industry standard and Marvel was um, sort of the scrappy other player. To cash in on the trend, Timely hired a team to produce its own line of superheroes. Cartoonists Joe Simon and Jack Kirby would go on to create some of Marvel's most famous characters. And as America entered the Second World War, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute... Timely's patriotic superhero, who battled real-life enemies in World War II, struck a chord with soldiers and their families back home. I think that it was a way to see victory, to have an idea of what that would feel like. The 1930s and 40s were the golden age of comics in the United States. 
And as American soldiers brought their comics overseas, they also gained popularity in Korea and Japan and helped influence the development of local manga comics. But in the 1950s, there was a growing movement against violence and gore in comic books. Comic books arouse in children fantasies of sadistic joy. It resulted in regulation that severely limited the kind of content publishers could print. The comics code ensured that you wouldn't have vampires and drugs in a comic. Everything was now just completely defanged and no fun, so comic sales plummeted. By the early 1960s, Marvel was struggling just to stay in business. The company's editor-in-chief, Stan Lee, was ready to quit. But then Marvel's old rival, DC Comics, threw together its most popular characters into a single supergroup. Their mission, to fight injustice and to serve all mankind. The Justice League became a surprise hit and inspired Stan Lee and artist Jack Kirby to create their own team of superheroes. The greatest team of superheroes the world has ever known. Fantastic Four. The first issue broke convention with all superhero archetypes of the day. Unlike the stoic and near-flawless Superman and Batman, Lee and Kirby's heroes came not just with superpowers, but with problems that readers could relate to. It was the beginning of characters having a three-dimensionality that really set Marvel apart. Danny Fingeroth edited some of Marvel's most famous superheroes for close to two decades. Marvel Comics gave you a depth of characterization where people could work together but not like each other or like each other but be angry at each other or quit the team. As far as comic books, that was fairly unprecedented. A year later, Marvel strayed even further from comic conventions. For the first time, a teenager became a superhero. Such was Marvel's impact, there's now an exhibit dedicated to its famous character in New York. Spider-Man is, is my favorite character now. He's very complex, and yet he's very simple. He's, he's the most like a regular person. Peter Parker was shy and introverted, didn't have a lot of friends. Also has to work two or three extra jobs, and then has a sick relative, and yet wants to excel, uh, and he wants to try to have a social life. I mean, it's, it's really a very modern story, right? It's about a kid who has more responsibilities than any kid should have, especially the responsibility of being Spider-Man. Great power comes great responsibility. Spider-Man became the most popular comic book character since Superman, but Marvel's biggest innovation was just round the corner. As more superheroes emerged, they began to interact and cross over with each other's stories. This collective became known as the Marvel Universe. The narrative of the Marvel Universe is just a staggering achievement that I think is really the most complicated narrative that probably exists in history. It wasn't just a new universe that Stan Lee and his collaborators forged. In periodic updates, Stan Lee gave readers a glimpse into the inner workings of the Marvel office, featuring writers, artists, and even secretaries. So you had two levels of connection um, in every comic. Uh, you had not just the stories themselves, but you had updates of what was going on in the office, and you had a sense that you knew the people behind the stories. Uh, they were like almost surrogate family members. The team at Marvel became as popular with fans as the superheroes they created. I think Stan Lee is one of those figures without whom there might not be a comic book industry, both creatively and on a business and promotional level. He reinvented what the superhero uh, was and could be. By the 1970s, 
Marvel was the number one comic book company in the world, releasing 40 different titles every month and selling 50 million comics a year in more than 100 countries. Its superheroes even became stars on animated shows. The company traditionally in second place to its rival, DC Comics, was now number one. But it somehow retained its status as an underdog. So you had DC Comics with Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman, and everybody knows those characters. But with Marvel, we were like the struggling company. We had, we had Spider-Man and the Hulk and these guys who had problems. And so it, even though we were the best-selling comics, we were still the underdog. Lou Bank joined Marvel in the mid-1980s. As the underdog, you're the guys who were fighting the good fight, and it felt like we were all fighting the good fight. But as the company became increasingly successful, that changed. People were laughing, and then people were excited, and then people were greedy. The owners of Marvel became progressively less knowledgeable and less interested in the comic books. They weren't in it for the long haul. They wanted to make as much money as they could make right now, right here, and damn the consequences. And things were about to get even worse when Marvel was sold to a financier called Ron Perlman. By the 1980s, the comic industry was booming worldwide with people hungry for heroes. Once considered cheap and disposable, comics have become prized items and speculators were snapping up issues in bulk to resell them to collectors for enormous profits. The frenzy also reached Asia's shores, including the Philippines, India and Singapore. 83-year-old Bill Teo opened his comic book store in Singapore 30 years ago. There's something special when you open the comics, the colours. It's a strange kind of feeling you get. Okay. At one time, there was only one specialist store like this in Singapore, and the lady who owned it was charging ridiculous prices. One day at cover price, and the next day it can be three, four times. My son and I both were comic readers, and after a year or two, we said, this is getting to be ridiculous. Then we decided to open a store. When the comic boom hit, Bill's comics sold out fast. When the speculative market was rife, comics were selling like hotcakes, you know what I mean? The queue was around the block. Fantastic. Jerry Hines also witnessed the value of comics in Singapore surge. There were certain cases where a comic might cost, say, five Singapore dollars. But within the space of two months, it could worth as much as $50. And then some hundreds of dollars. In the US, vintage comics that cost $400 in the 1970s shot up to $5,000 US dollars a decade later. By the early 90s, some first issue comics were worth $40,000 US dollars and up. To cash in, the number of specialty comic book stores surged globally, from a few hundred to over 10,000. As rare and new comic books were flying off the shelves, Marvel attracted the interest of millionaire businessman Ron Perlman, who bought the company for over 80 million US dollars in 1989. Perlman would significantly change the way Marvel ran its business. Perlman was kind of a step above a, a conglomerate owner. He was, um, he was a corporate raider. He was somebody who had no emotional connection to the comics. So, you know, this was Marvel's first real existence as uh, kind of a, a piece in someone's game. I can remember Ron coming through the office during that first week, and he was, he was he may not have been smoking the cigar, but he was at least chewing the cigar. He was just this short little man who looked like he owned the world, being toured through the offices by a young woman dressed as Spider-Woman in spandex. 
And to me, that's who Ron Perlman will always be. This guy who owns the world and can make young women dress up in spandex. Lou Bank joined Marvel two years before Perlman brought over the company. When I started at Marvel, you know, I was, I was surrounded by the people whose comics I had grown up reading. It was really amazing. It was fun, it was exciting. Everybody was thrilled to be there. When the announcement came that the company was being sold, everybody was nervous. And, and as we saw Perlman walking through the office, we became more nervous. To drive growth, Perlman first set out to raise the price of comic books by appealing to collectors. They started marketing their comics as products, as collector's items, as things that were other than you know, the inherent value of, uh, of something you read. We had a practice of doing special covers, enhanced covers, glow-in-the-dark covers, foil covers, hologram covers, and adding a glow-in-the-dark cover caused us to take that same 32-page comic book that we sold for $1.15 instead of make it $2.95. And the short-term consequences of that were that we would sell four times as many copies of that comic. Double the price, sell four times the comic. Looks great on the bottom line. Initially, Perlman's strategy worked dramatically. Over the next couple of years, Marvel's revenues grew by 50% and its profits multiplied sixfold. In 1991, the company went public and its market value ballooned to 3 billion US dollars. We all thought that was hilarious because we're just a bunch of guys running around the office shooting each other with plastic guns at night. But the mood at Marvel changed significantly after the initial public offering. With shareholders now expecting bigger returns, the pressure at Marvel intensified. When Marvel goes public, that's when profits have to be up every quarter. Marvel started just increasing production at a, at a crazy rate. In 1985, Marvel had been publishing 40 titles a month. By 1993, they'd more than doubled that number. But printing so many comics and specialty covers started to dilute the Marvel brand. These are all different gimmicks, some of them very nice gimmicks, but gimmicks are gimmicks. Eventually, they, they run a bit thin. But for Ron Perlman, you couldn't get enough of a good thing. I can't remember a month that we weren't the number one publisher. That didn't satisfy the Perlman administration. When we hit 68% market share, that didn't satisfy the Perlman administration. So more enhanced covers and more titles. Perlman's marketing team also began to dictate the content of the comics. Artists and writers were told to engineer more crossover stories that featured its best-selling superheroes to display at comic book stores like this one in New York. We knew that there were people, there were Ravenous, Wolverine, and Punisher, and always Spider-Man collectors. And all you gotta do is put those characters into a, a low-selling comic and suddenly you sell more copies because people wanted to maintain their complete Spider-Man collection or their complete Wolverine collection. But at some point, the guy who collects every appearance of Wolverine can no longer afford to collect every appearance of Wolverine. At some point, you chase the guy away by trying to take too much of his money. The plots also figured into one another, so readers had to buy all related issues if they wanted to make sense of them. As production increased, the quality and content of the comics began to suffer. And this started to alienate the company's core audience. But if Marvel was losing readers, why was it still seeing a record number of sales every month? The problem was the distribution system. Unlike traditional newsstands, specialty comic book shops can't return unsold copies for a refund. If the issues don't sell, retailers shoulder the cost. So Marvel couldn't tell how many comics the shops were actually selling to customers. And this was about to become a big problem. Bookstore manager Jeff Ayres discovered shops that had bought a huge oversupply of comic books for speculators. 
I had seen it in other stores that I worked out and hung at, the basement lawn boxes of, these, of millions of books. They're spawn number one, box one, box two, box three, box four. And it's because stores had bought so much of this manufactured tripe uh, and told that that's gonna, everybody's gonna want 50 of those. And it just wasn't the case. And then, I mean, a lot of stores start hurting. When news got to Lou Bank, he went to the comic book stores to find out what was going on. When you had those conversations with comic book store owners about what they were selling and what they were sitting on, that's when they started getting very dark and the conversation was very bleak. And it gave me the sense that something was going on here that we needed to recognize. Lou sent field representatives out to survey comic stores across the country. Their findings were shocking. Every time Marvel sold its special editions, subsequent issues saw a 20% decline in sales. Readers were getting tired of expensive and gimmicky comics that were mainly marketed to collectors and speculators. Lou sent an urgent memo to Marvel's senior management. And I'm sure I cc'd six million other people, showing that we were literally chasing away our long-term readers, our long-term customers, by doing these enhanced covers. And the reaction to that memo was silence. Marvel continued to publish enhanced covers and also began to include trading cards to encourage more collectors, alienating even more of their readers. Meanwhile, comic book shops, unable to cope with unsold stock, started to close down. So it just seemed absolutely absurd to me. You know, now I understand what they were doing. They weren't in it for the long haul. They wanted to make as much money as they could make right now, right here, and damn the consequences. Damn the, 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 the people who suffered the results of their decision. We got what we needed out of them. We don't need them anymore. I didn't want to be a part of that strip mining. I didn't want to be a part of what I saw as the coming downfall of Marvel. The insatiable drive for profit at Marvel was also beginning to wear thin with its creative team. By this time, founding editor-in-chief Stan Lee had moved to California to pursue Hollywood deals for the company. And the new editors left in charge weren't being allowed to do their jobs. The editor's job was to set direction for the comic, and suddenly there was this, this marketing division that was setting direction. And the editors were not happy. They feel like they should have more say in what the stories are. At some point, that created a conflict. And certainly demoralized the people uh, working in editorial, and that's the double-edged sort of being fans. You have this nostalgic feeling for the characters, you also know you're in a business, and that's that constant tug of war. You had all these editors slamming their heads up against the wall to make the comics that they were responsible for spike in sales. It got really sad, and, and there was more infighting, and people were just unhappy. They weren't having fun. And then in 1992, the inevitable happened. In a mass exodus, Marvel's top talent left to join rivals and to form their own publishing houses. By alienating writers and artists who had developed stories, who had popularized the characters, Marvel ended up setting themselves up for failure. As comic book readers followed their favorite artists to the new labels, Marvel's market share dropped from 45 to 30 percent. Meanwhile, their special and collectible comics had oversaturated the market. If you print tens of thousands of a particular kind of comic, immediately it can't be worth as much. So it's, it was kind of like a victim of its own success. In 1993, when speculators and collectors realized that the value of comics had been inflated, the comic industry imploded. 
publisher sales plummeted by 70%. And nine out of 10 comic book stores in America closed their doors. In the Philippines, Malaysia, and Singapore, it was no different. Before the crash came, there were about 20 plus stores. Now there are only three or four at the most left. Although Bill's shop survived, he had hundreds of boxes of unsold issues. $50,000 worth of comics I incinerated a lot. I had to hire a truck to carry those to the incinerator. Back in the US, the comics division that had once made up 90% of Marvel's sales was now a third of its business. In a desperate attempt to spur growth, Perlman had gone on an acquisition spree. From trading card manufacturers to sticker companies and a toy retailer, Perlman drove Marvel's debt up to 600 million US dollars, all the while moving it further and further away from its core, comic books. By 1995, the company was in crisis. It reported a $48 million loss, the first time since Perlman had bought the company that they hadn't turned a profit. Its stock value collapsed. Shares, once worth $35 in 1993, had sunk to just $2. As a result, Marvel announced company-wide cuts. 40% of its workforce was let go. After almost two decades at the company, editor Danny Fingeroth made the difficult decision to leave. I was heartbroken to leave Marvel. Things had changed there in such a way that it was very unpleasant for me on a day-to-day -day basis. But, you know, I'd worked there for 18 years. It, it was where I'd grown up. You know, I'd say outside of the end of a romantic relationship or the death of a loved one, leaving Marvel was the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me. By 1996, Marvel reported a staggering loss of over 460 million US dollars. The company desperately needed cash to keep running and to pay back its debts. But in a disagreement with shareholders over the company's future, Perlman declared bankruptcy. As majority owner, it gave him the power to reorganize Marvel without their consent. But in doing so, Perlman dragged the company's reputation through the mud in a series of very public court battles. Surrounded by the smoldering ruin of its comic book empire, Marvel was in its darkest hour, and the future looked bleak. There was a lot of screaming on telephones and threats to destroy one another. There was something that was so absurd and grotesque about these cold-hearted men suing each other to have custody of something that emotionally a lot of comic readers thought belonged to them. In 1998, after a two-year battle, it was finally over. Ron Perlman sued for diverting over 500 million US dollars from Marvel to his other businesses, was ousted from the company. But Marvel was still broke, surviving on a $200 million loan that had to be repaid soon. It now needed a superhero of its own to save the day. In 1999, the company brought in Peter Cuneo. Known as the turnaround king, He'd successfully guided six businesses through tough times, including cosmetics company Clairol and security hardware group Black & Decker. But hiring Cuneo to rescue Marvel was a huge risk. He knew nothing about the comic book industry. I was not a particularly a comic book fan. I wasn't immersed at all in the comic book world or the comic book community, so I had to learn that. But a crash course is all Cuneo would have time for. The company's stock had fallen to a dismal 96 cents a share. With Marvel in disarray and investors impatient for results, the pressure on Cuneo was intense. Turnarounds are not for everybody. They really, in fact, you have to be a little nuts to do what I do. Really, it's not normal. My experience has been that things are always worse than you thought they were, and there will be sleepless nights. 
With barely $3 million in the bank, the first thing that kept Cuneo up at night was how to get Marvel the cash it desperately needed. For 26 million US dollars, Marvel sold its sticker and trading card companies, a mere fraction of the $400 million Perlman had spent on them. While Cuneo searched for ways to settle the company's remaining debt, he also had to start reviving Marvel's lifeline. It's comic books. They had to get their readers back, but years of gimmicks had left their stories in a sorry state. To reinvigorate them, he would have to convince some of the creatives who had left Marvel to return. A, a lot of the creative people, particularly in the comic book industry, felt that they had been mistreated, frankly, by the company. Obviously, we wanted to get the best back, and so that's what I was doing, was basically courting people. The creative people in most business are the ones that actually make you money. Um, and so the, the people working in the creative jobs have to feel wanted, needed, and rewarded. Cuneo immediately instigated a complete change of atmosphere. He gave his artists the freedom to work. He also tasked former US sports executive and comic fan Bill Jameis with reviving Marvel's superhero comics. At the time, the company was publishing 60 monthly titles that were filled with convoluted plots threading back to the 1960s. He recognized, I think, that it's very difficult to get new readers into the comic book industry because if you want to get emotionally attached to a character or a set of characters, let's say Spider-Man, you had to come in at issue 475. So you had 40 years of storytelling. So Bill recognized that we had to start telling the stories of our major characters all over again from their origin. And he started a new series of comic books that did that. Bill Jameis also gave the series an upgrade for the new millennium. Peter Parker became a tech geek with an internship at the E-Bugle. The first issue of The Ultimate Spider-Man became an instant hit. By the early 2000s, Marvel had reclaimed its lead in the comic industry's market share. Meanwhile, Cuneo and his team had thought of another way to try and solve the company's cash problems and pay back its loans. They would focus on Marvel's most valuable asset, its unique library of comic book characters. We needed a business that would generate a lot of cash. And this is why we adapted as our business model, a licensing model. In licensing, it does not require us to put up much capital. Marvel began licensing out its characters for toys, clothes, school supplies, and video games. But to generate more revenue, the company's characters needed to appeal to a much wider market, not just hardcore comic fans. So Marvel turned to Hollywood. Movies were just always just out of reach for Stan Lee, um, although he'd, he'd been trying to get them made for decades. I'm out here hoping to put these and other properties into movies and television shows. Well, let's, uh... Unfortunately for Marvel's famous editor-in-chief, previous licensing deals with studios had been anything but successful. Partly due to the limits of technology, and partly because Marvel had no creative control over the movies. Films like Howard the Duck in 1986... You think I might find happiness in the animal kingdom, Ducky? ...were critical and financial disasters. Cuneo and his team decided that Marvel would, from now on, tightly control how their movies were made. They would commission the scripts, hire good quality directors, and find the right cast for the characters themselves and then partner with large Hollywood studios to produce and distribute the movies. Marvel was finally moving in a new direction, toward dealing in intellectual property instead of selling products. We had to look at our characters as talent, and we had to treat them as if they were living people, but we had to also run them like brands. Spider-Man is a brand. Marvel's hope was that a successful film would transform its other businesses. If someone goes to your movies, they're probably going to buy toys for their kids. 
Someone plays you video games, they're going to go to the movies. Kids like the toys, you're going to buy back to school products for them. And on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now seeing the beginnings of another stage of human evolution. X-Men was released in the year 2000 to critical acclaim and grossed over 290 million US dollars worldwide. X-Men 1 proves something very important to Marvel and I think the rest of the entertainment industry. And that is that you could have a big success financially if you made a good film, even if the general public did not know the characters. 99% never heard of the X-Men before they started seeing trailers. And we had people lining up around the block when the film was opening. Suddenly, superheroes were all the rage and big budget adaptations like Spider-Man, The Hulk and Daredevil also became massive hits. After seven years of decline, Marvel was finally able to nurse its balance sheet back to health. But the company's future was still uncertain. Marvel's movies like X-Men had been a smashing success, but the company wasn't getting the full profits from its partnership with Hollywood Studios. When Sony's two Spider-Man films made a combined $3 billion worldwide, Marvel only received $6 million from selling the character rights. The new management came up with a radical idea. Marvel should produce its own films and keep 100% of the profits. It was a bold plan, but not everyone agreed it was a good one. Marvel had never produced a film before, and a flop in Hollywood could cost them millions. The idea of us taking some financial risk on films was not initially particularly popular with some of our investors. Uh, but what I think that people on the outside didn't understand is we had been apprenticing on 12 films. We had learned how to make hits. In 2005, the company's board gave Marvel Studios the green light. To finance its films, Marvel struck a risky deal with wealth management firm Merrill Lynch. It offered up 10 of its most prized characters, including Captain America, Thor and Iron Man, as collateral for a massive $520 million cash reservoir to make 10 movies. But if Marvel Studios failed, all of their superheroes would belong to the bank. As Marvel Studios went into production for its first film, Iron Man, it decided to take an even bigger risk and break with Hollywood convention. Hollywood has a tendency, when they're worried about a film, to cast very well-known and often highly paid actors and actresses because they will, quote, guarantee the box office. We didn't believe in insurance, and we thought that the characters were so strong, the company really viewed these characters as the stars. They found their Tony Stark in Robert Downey Jr. But at the time, he was better known for his past problems with addiction rather than his acting talent. The choice was seen as a big gamble. He'd had some ups and downs in his life and his career. Uh, so there was certainly some natural questioning about, uh, well, is this the right casting? Yeah. But the people running Marvel Studios showed the Marvel board Robert Downey Jr.'s screen test. In this audition in 2006, Robert Downey Jr. is reading for one of the go? first scenes in Iron Man. What do you got? What's getting you through the cold nights, huh? Don't ask, don't tell. Did... <laughs> Jimmy better go. He's on script for the first couple of minutes, and then he just goes off as Robert can do. And he, right in front of us, became Tony Stark. Done. You're still Buckingham Palace. What do we got? <laughs> what, I got to break out the psyops? There it is. There's a smile. It's okay. Yeah, so it's natural. Less, less muscles to smile. Yeah. Serious. Iron Man, of course, became a massive success, largely due to Danny Jr.'s unorthodox take on Tony Stark. Is it better to be feared or respected? And I say, is it too much to ask for both? It ranked number one at the box office and grossed over $580 million on a budget of $140 million. Damn. Good luck keeping up.
In Iron Man's post credit scene, Marvel set up not only their next movie, The Avengers, but a whole new world of overlapping characters. Nick Fury, director of S.H.I.E.L.D. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. The Marvel Cinematic Universe was born. Realizing the huge potential in Marvel's library of superheroes, Disney purchased the company for four billion US dollars in 2009. With Disney's global reach, the tie-up catapulted a whole galaxy of Marvel's star characters to a new level. To date, its movies have grossed over 12 billion US dollars worldwide, making it the biggest film franchise in history. You think you can stop me? Marvel's remarkable turnaround was in large part helped by its burgeoning popularity in Asia. As time progresses, it's proving that Asia is very important to companies like Marvel. Um, movies, for example, like Ant-Man, which was one of Marvel's relatively unknown characters, that did very well in China. I think the movie grossed somewhere around 140 million worldwide. And of that, one third was contributed to the Chinese market. But the heart of Marvel's business, its comic books, is in decline. In their heyday, publishers could sell a million copies per issue. These days, selling 40,000 is considered a success. Now a new battle is brewing in the comic book industry. Marvel is looking to expand its business in Asia, and that means its burly superheroes must take on the enduringly popular starry-eyed girls of manga. But it won't be that easy. Manga is a form of comics that originates from Japan. It's very different to superheroes in the fact that a lot of the characters are very young. The art style is very unique, and the story types are very different to Western comics as well. And manga, generally speaking, in Asia, is much more popular than the Western genre. Manga dominates almost every major city in the region. It has more than 50% of the market share in Taiwan and Hong Kong, while Western comics take less than 11% here. To compete, Marvel knows it has to build a stronger emotional connection to Asian readers, particularly at regional events like the Singapore Comic Convention. One of the most exciting event of the year for comic book geeks and movie buffs alike. Singaporean illustrator and avid Marvel fan Gary Chu comes here every year. In a way, it's a celebration of people with like-minded hobbies, like-minded interests. Although interest in American superheroes has grown, the characters on display here don't really reflect Marvel's new target audience. Generally speaking, if you look at Asians, they would perhaps like to see more of themselves within the characters. Hence, now the shift by companies like Marvel to introduce more Asian characters into the genre as well. Marvel's always had Asian characters, but, you know, truth be told, they've always been a little bit stereotypical. They were created by writers based mainly in the West, and if it was a Japanese character, it was based on a ninja or a samurai or a geisha. If it was a Chinese character, it was always kung fu. C.B. Sobolski is Marvel's man in the East, responsible for bringing the Marvel Universe to Asia and vice versa. He's here scouting for local artists to incorporate deeper Asian influences in the comics. What we're looking for now is to bring a little more authenticity to it. Since our fan base has gone global, we want the people to feel like the world is outside their window, so that the characters are authentically Asian from the actual cities, and that the writers who we're hiring and the artists that we're hiring are bringing a piece of their lives to those characters to make them feel, you know, just really real to the readers. Marvel's new characters are now gradually starting to reflect the diverse readers the company wants to connect with. And for the first time in their history, a Muslim superhero is headlining her own comic book. Miss Marvel, she's a Muslim Pakistani American. I think it's great because right now they're getting fans to understand that hey, there's a bigger, there's a bigger picture here. There's more people. There's a lot of other different ethnicities living together. Local illustrators like Jerry Tio and Gary Chu, who are keen to work for Marvel, attend regional comic conventions to connect with people in the industry. Every year, 
uh, Singapore Comic Con, they, they invite really high profile artists over. I'm super stoked to meet them. Gary Chu got his big break here four years ago when he met Marvel's talent scout, C.B. Sobelski. I was super nervous, but he looked at my portfolio, he felt like cool. And we, uh, we just got in touch with each other after. Yeah, so it was awesome. The first cover I drew for Marvel was uh, X-Men Special. I was really happy with the outcome. They loved it, and I couldn't wait for it to be printed. Today, Gary continues to work as a freelance artist for Marvel. As an illustrator, I reached a, a level where I've delivered art that's exportable around the globe. And to me, that is very satisfying. Though films and licensing deals remain Marvel's main business, it continues to develop its comics for a more global audience, based on the strong tradition of storytelling that Stan Lee and his collaborators began in the 1960s. I think any good story appeals to anyone anywhere. And usually, it's a case of someone being down on their luck or having a problem somewhere. They're then given great power and what it is they do with that power. That's a pretty universal kind of um, story. Marvel has a wealth of characters that have never been explored in any shape or form that, should they get that right, they will be here for many, many, many years to come. 